I can't believe I have to say it, but you shouldn't laugh at poor people. <laughs> Oh. But doing exactly that has become one of the most popular content genres in personal finance. And even if you are the one doing the laughing, it's still probably costing you money. So, by the way, you shouldn't buy a Mercedes if you're a broke person. That's stupid. Don't be debt dumb, people. Hear me? Personal finance is not really that complicated, which is a problem for people that have built entire media brands around the subject. Nobody is going to tune into a radio show, buy the latest book, watch a weekly upload, or attend a two-day seminar that just says save money, avoid high interest debt, and invest broadly on repeat. Some of these people are making millions of dollars every year from their audiences, so they need to come up with new and exciting ways to say the same thing. One of the most popular ways to pad out personal finance content has become live reactions to people's personal situations. A guest will come on the show to discuss their personal financial situation, and the host will give advice to the person to help them clear up their debt, earn additional income, reduce their expenses, or make investments. You might think this sounds like a harmless way for people in desperate situations to get some much needed advice, and for the influencers audience to learn from other people's mistakes. Two years ago, when I first covered the problems with personal finance influencers, I said the reaction content was the least harmful thing they did when the alternative was making uneducated predictions about specific stocks or cryptos. But I was wrong for three reasons. The first reason is that there's very little to learn from these shows and all you are going to get from them is financial stress. Did you know that having $100,000 in credit card debt and choosing not to work full time is bad for your personal finances? If so, you probably already know everything you could learn by watching people in extremely poor financial situations. So why else do people watch it? The Dave Ramsey Show has over 23 million listeners every week. Suze Orman had similar viewership when her show aired on CNBC. Financial stress is at an all-time high. A 2022 survey conducted by CNBC found that 70% of Americans were stressed about their personal finances. Watching people that have made even worse personal finance decisions is a great coping mechanism to put personal worries into perspective, but it's not a good long-term solution. Watching this kind of personal finance content makes it easier to justify poor financial decisions, because at least it's not as bad as the guy who financed a Tesla while working part-time at Arby's. These shows also bring on guests that are doing extremely well financially, which will only add to a listener's financial stress. If the show can't find an extremely wealthy guest to talk to openly about their finances, the show hosts themselves will normally step up to tell everybody watching how rich they are. Comparison is not only the thief of joy, but it can also motivate people to take unnecessary risks to catch up to people that are not representative of a normal financial situation. The producers behind these shows know that extreme financial situations sell well in today's fight for attention, and this leads to stories that are simply made up. Now, I am not calling out anybody for directly lying to their audience, but these shows get millions of views and people are willing to do crazy things for their 15 minutes of fame. It would be difficult for showrunners to individually vet every single caller, so at a certain point, they need to assume that a guest is being honest with them. If the guest makes up a crazy story about being in terrible debt or making a million dollars a month from dropshipping at the age of 12, then that makes great content that will stand out even if it does come at the expense of the viewer's financial understanding. Made-up situations are not going to teach you anything about personal finance. You are probably not in the extreme financial situations of these guests. You don't need to know how to most effectively cash out on your late stage startup, and you already know that payday loans are bad. You are really watching this for entertainment, and that entertainment is not harmless. So it's time to learn how money works to find out the problems with laughing at poor people. Yes, really. This week's lesson was sponsored by my brand new newsletter, Compounded Daily. There's a lot of interesting stories happening every week that I just can't share with you all because they just wouldn't do well with the YouTube algorithm. But by signing up to my totally new, totally free email newsletter, you can get interesting stories like how Apple is trying to literally trademark the fruit. Yes, they are. This newsletter will cover interesting finance, business, and economic subjects, so if you're interested in what I post here, I am certain you'll like what I post there. Go to compounddaily.com to sign up for my newsletter. The second problem with laughing at poor people on personal finance shows is that the hosts of these shows are often wrong about even basic financial information. And worst of all, they are confidently wrong. Dave Ramsey is as popular for his larger-than-life personality as he is for his content. Personal finance show hosts like Ramsey rarely have the qualifications they need to give individualized financial advice to someone in a typical advisor-client setting. Most financial accreditations would actually forbid their members from giving advice in the manner that these hosts do in front of their audience. This is just stupid. It's stupid on steroids. There is no denying that people with no financial education would benefit from hearing that they need to save money, pay off debt, and invest. 
Ramsey, with his large audience, can teach that lesson to millions of people, which is good. But in order to keep his audience entertained, he ventures into giving advice that no licensed professional would. Ramsey and his copycats advise something called the debt snowball to people who want to pay off debt. The debt snowball starts with the person paying off their smallest debt first, and then their second smallest, and so on, keeping their largest debt to last with no consideration for interest rates, loan periods, or fees for early repayment. They also instruct their listeners to make investments while paying off debt, even if the interest rates on their debt are higher than the investment returns they could reasonably hope to achieve. If you had $1,000 and could pay off a loan at a 20% interest rate or invest into the market where you could hope to make between 8 and 12%, it makes sense to pay off the loan first because getting rid of the loan is going to put you in a better position every year. There are other benefits to prioritizing high interest debt too. If you miss a payment on a loan, it can hurt your credit and cost you extra money in late fees. That's not even the worst advice these guys give. Paying off your smallest loan first, regardless of interest rates or repayment conditions, is just dumb. Paying off the highest interest debt first, while avoiding loans with early repayment fees, can save people tens of thousands of dollars and wipe years off their debt management plan. The reason that show hosts stand so confidently behind their suggestions is because they claim the psychological gratification you get from closing debt is worth approaching the problem in a mathematically inefficient way. Paying off debt is a mentally taxing exercise, so the show hosts do have a point here but there are better ways to maintain discipline that don't also cost thousands of dollars. Psychology is also why Ramsey suggests people build a nest egg at the same time as paying off debt. The mental boost that comes from seeing savings grow while watching debt shrink supposedly keeps people disciplined. Good financial advice should consider a client's financial discipline, skill set, and headspace, but it's ironic that the show hosts make these kinds of concessions for psychology now while completely ruining it and making it even worse in other ways, but we will get to that soon. Ramsey and other finance show hosts also make recommendations based on their own personal experience instead of their clients' needs or professional best practices. Ramsey recommended load funds where investment fees of around 5% are paid up front. These are viable financial products, but only for a certain type of investor. Ramsey's personal history with being overlevered on his mortgage and his personal branding as someone who hates debt means he only recommends a 15-year mortgage. A 30-year mortgage can be a responsible way for people to buy a nicer home or simply maintain cash flow flexibility. He also suggests that people can live on 8% of their retirement savings every year once they quit working full-time. The usual recommendation from financial professionals is 5%, with some advising as low as 3%. But again, it depends on the person and their situation. Without accounting for other factors, Ramsey's advice could cause a lot of listeners to go broke in retirement. Dave Ramsey is only the most famous example of these show hosts, which is why I'm picking on him in particular. But because it's impossible to give personalized advice to someone in a 20-minute phone call, they will all have the same problems. The confidence of these live characters, even when addressing genuine criticism from professionals, is what makes their show so popular. In defense of Dave and his copycats, someone paying their debt in whatever order is going to be better off than someone not paying their debt at all. Where this truly gets harmful is when they are confidently wrong about the advice that will make their guests and viewers worse off than if they had not received that advice at all. We all know about the finfluencers and celebrities that made millions of dollars by promoting FTX, a fraudulent crypto exchange, with some obvious warning signs. The confidence of the influencers in presenting bad financial advice to their audience looking for their insights into a complicated subject is why it was so damaging to people that didn't have the skills or didn't feel the need to do their own due diligence. All investing carries risk, and people need to take some level of personal responsibility for their personal finances. But when a host presents themselves as an infallible authority on all things finance, they must accept that people will blindly follow them. Ramsey himself is opposed to cryptocurrency, so he was not caught up in the FTX scandal but he isn't innocent of endorsing products that have caused his followers harm because they trust his financial advice. I mean, I, I'm not a fan of FTX. I'm not a fan of crypto. Certainly not a fan of Bankman Fried or Freed, whichever way you want to say it. And uh, <laughs> Fried is my preference. Ramsey is currently facing a lawsuit for $150 million for his involvement in promoting Timeshare Exit a company that would take a client's money up front and try and negotiate them out of a timeshare contract. Timeshare exit team will get you out of their timeshare. Now, you're going to pay them money to do that. That's what they do. And they charge you up front, and they give you your money back guarantee if they don't get you out, but they'll get you out. Timeshares are a common investment trap that unsophisticated investors fall into. The annual fees on these contracts are steep, and canceling is made extremely difficult by the terms of the contracts and the unscrupulous companies that offer timeshares. Timeshare Exit presented a solution to people in this desperate situation with the promise that they would negotiate out of these contracts on their client's behalf. 
In practice, their service was just as much of a fraud as the timeshares themselves, and after clients paid their upfront fee, they were told to go and negotiate with the timeshares provider directly. We felt more comfortable doing it because of Dave Ramsey's recommendation. Ramsey probably was looking for a solution to offer his audience, and I do believe he is a man of good intentions. But he still allegedly took more than $30 million in endorsement deals from a fraudulent business between 2015 and 2021. The lawsuit is unlikely to go anywhere because there is no precedent for spokespeople to be held responsible for the actions of the companies they endorse, but it shows how damaging confident advice can be to a trusting audience. Mr. Ramsey, Mr. Ramsey, why are you endorsing Timeshare Exit Team? I'll answer your question. Why did I endorse Timeshare Exit Team? Because they were doing the right thing and getting people out of timeshares after companies had screwed them. No company is going to maintain a $30 million sponsorship deal for six years unless they are seeing a return on their investment. So that means Ramsey fans that were already in poor financial situations lost at least an additional $30 million because of the trust they had in Ramsey trust that is reaffirmed by his confident and uncompromising persona. And that's the third problem with laughing at poor people on shows like this. It's not giving anybody a practical solution. Let's be honest. When we see a strong, common-sense character like Ramsey rip into guests for making dumb financial decisions, there is a sense of catharsis that makes us feel good because we can never be so dumb. The show hosts pander to this by playing along and outlining their dismal situation with big, catchy thumbnails. If you assume that the guests and their stories are real, then the tough love approach of people like Ramsey is not the correct way to address very personal and often very embarrassing financial details. It's true that the guests on these shows go on there of their own free will, and I want to repeat that a lot of times they are going on there for clout and not advice. But even if they are all honest people wanting to fix up their situations, being the target of ridicule will only make other people in similar situations more likely to cover up or ignore their problems. The tough love approach and the careful selection of irresponsible guests also perpetuates the idea that anybody can become financially stable if only they stop being stupid with their money. One, you, uh, you've you done some great work and in some ways I love you. In other ways, you're stupid and arrogant. To reaffirm their point, show hosts will use their own financial success as proof that their system works. Ramsey has frequently bragged about his personal fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars when addressing critics without acknowledging that it wasn't avoiding debt or saving regularly that got him there. It was a media empire with millions of devout fans that sells books, merchandise, and sponsor slots to allegedly fraudulent businesses. So there's nothing hypocritical here. And uh, as a matter of fact, when I say we've built wealth and we have a, a net worth of over $100 million, most of that's in real estate and, and, and this company, obviously. And so am I bragging? No, I'm bragging on the stuff we teach. Despite all of this, I still like Ramsey and a lot of his copycats as a guilty viewing pleasure. If you already have a decent understanding of basic personal finance, you're about as likely to improve your finances watching these shows as you are to improve your martial arts by watching the WWE. If anything, this has as much to do with the changing mediascape of entertainment as it does with personal finance. To understand what I mean, go and watch my video on how online streaming has brought back the old days of Hollywood, and unwittingly made alternative entertainment like this so popular. Now, before I end, I need to give a special thanks to the real sponsors of this video. You. When I created this channel, my goal was to ultimately help people spot nefarious actors and bad financial advice on YouTube. Ultimately, I don't want to see people fall for advice from people whom they deem to be an expert on YouTube only to lose all of their money. Sadly, just like many of you, I have seen this happen to family, friends, and the people I love. So I'm asking you to join me on this project by signing up to my Patreon. This week, I'm kicking off a Patreon fundraising campaign to hit the goal of $5,000 a month. That amount of reliable and consistent support will mean that no matter what happens to the sponsorship market or ad revenue, I'll still be able to grow the team and reach more people. If you'd like to support my mission, then chip in a little with the link down below to help more people keep on learning how money works.